yeah, good afternoon to everyone. It's great to great to be here um, talking about a subject which I feel so passionate about, um, about uh, the question of, of getting our relationship with technology, um, uh, getting it right. Um, this is something I've been writing and talking about for, for many years. Um, as David says, I'm a I'm a lawyer by by training, um, although I never went into practice. I've spent my career in technology, um, um, but it was only um, it was only when I was running a data science company um, about ten years ago that I realised that uh, we were in danger of crossing the creepy line so many times. Um, and actually, it's those of us with a liberal arts background, um, a social sciences background, that potentially are uh, are excluded from the conversation and, and need to be more involved in this AI ethics conversation. Um, anyway, many, many years later, here I am, I'm a partner at Ethical by Design, which uh, is a firm uh, that aims to improve corporate governance through um, AI. Um, and um, this is going to be a, a, an interactive um, opportunity. So if you're sitting watching me uh, with a paper and pen, get it, get it ready, because um, there's something you can do uh, during, me, during the talk and hopefully something you can take away uh, back into your, your afternoon. Um, so, you know, you don't need me to, to to kind of start by talking about the opportunity that AI can bring. Um, I'm very much an optimist um, uh, um, about technology, and even though I'm not uh, not based in in Silicon Valley or even Silicon Roundabout in London, I'm I'm based uh, near Bristol. Um, you know, I'm I'm certainly somebody who's uh, been uh, been inspired by the Silicon Valley mindset and on the optimism that we have um, for technology. And when I think about entrepreneurs and tech and AI, um, there's probably no better example than, than this chap um, who, you know, I think is really the epitome of, of a 21st century entrepreneur. It's, it's who um, so many of us aspire to be uh, when we build, um, we build tech organizations. And indeed, um, Mark was uh, recognized um, in, uh, I think, 20, 2010, 2011 as the time person of the year, which is real um a, a real uh, trophy um a, a for him and um a real testament for um how much um you know how, how much how much good um facebook had done at until that point in terms of um uh, connecting people and and the and the secondary benefits that gave um but it was only just a few short years later that mark uh, was uh, will always be remembered um for uh, sort of the, the meme of the year in 2018 when he gave uh, evidence to uh, Senate, the US Senate, um, following the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, and a large reason for him being there was uh, this mantra of moving fast and breaking things, which uh, he'll always be um, uh, remembered for. But when I think about moving fast and breaking things, I, I think of this image, um, which as any parent of, of, of young children um, will, will know is, 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 you know, the worst nightmare. Um, but what's the worst nightmare for for tech CEOs is is reputational harm, and we've just seen this week, you know, in terms of the the impact that reputational harm can do on an organisation. HSBC found themselves in the, in the news yesterday for all the wrong reasons. The share price um, took a massive hit. There was real financial consequence to organisations, and Google, Microsoft, IBM, um, so many of the of the big tech companies that do so much good and do so much innovation also find themselves on the wrong side. Um, of reputational harm, and we call this the uh, the tech clash. And it's becoming more and more acute um, the fact that uh, that tech companies are, are are losing our trust. And this is my second talk today. I gave a talk this morning at a, uh, a conference looking at COVID and uh, contact tracing technology. Um, and um, the concern there is, you know, we as citizens have given up our civil liberties so freely. Um, and yet many of us are unwilling to download software onto our phones, which um, which could potentially save lives. So this this um, this lack of trust is a is a serious issue. Um, but when when you look at the technology industry's response to the tech clash, this is what you see. You see essentially a marketing exercise. And so many tech companies have published principles that are aimed at reassuring us. Um, and it's not just tech companies. I mentioned HSBC earlier. Um, you know, many organizations and in other industries have, have published these principles, um, which are there to essentially reassure us that they've got our back. And if that's you and that's your organization, I just say one thing, please, this afternoon, just stop <laughs> and listen and, and, and take on what I think will be a much more operational approach to managing ethics and protecting you and your firm against the tech clash. And so what I'm going to cover 
in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes or so is really why a principles-based approach actually will make the problem more acute for you and how to measure and monitor um, your, um, your, your, your AI ethics, which is something which um, I think very few people are in a position to be able to do. Um, so if we talk about AI ethics, what we're really talking about is, is, is two terms which mean so many different things to many different people. And we all know, um, those of us in the AI industry, that AI uh, is one of those terms that, that can mean you know, so much uh, to, 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 to many different people. And ethics is also one of those terms. And this is why talking about AI ethics is such a problem. This is the only equation, by the way, you're going to see from me this morning. Um, when I think about ethics, um, what I want to be really clear about is, is I don't see ethics as being equivalent to moral philosophy. Um, and um, actually, some work I did um, earlier uh, this year, I co-authored a paper, which um, um, if, if you can't grab the link on the screen, I'm very happy to send you a link to. Um, equally, you can Google um, MIT Tech Clash um, because uh, a summary was published on the MIT Tech Review. Um, and we did an analysis of ethics, uh, me and my co-author, and basically, you know, we, we have a view that actually ethics is something slightly different. And my co-author puts it very poetically. He says that ethics is like cooking, but not cu cuisine. Um, um, it's, it's the activity. Uh, it's, it's not the recipe. It's like playing and not sport. It's like singing and not music. Um, and I think this is an important thing, because if we recognize ethics to be um, to be as, as we define it, then actually you can do something really great and start to look at the conditions for ethical dialogue within your organization and within your wider stakeholder group. And that's something which you can, um, as I say, you can measure and, 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 and manage. Um, and so um, to explain this, I'm going to borrow my friend Max Tegmark. I'm going to list his help. So Max, as, as many of you will know, is the author of um, a great book um, where he talks about um, the future of, 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 of life um, in the context of AI. And Max and I both gave a, a talk earlier this year at um, the, um, the Lausanne um, EPFL AI event, the AMLD, in January, one of, one of the, probably the last conferences that, uh, that either of us has spoken at. And Max, um, you know, Max is an amazing contributor to the field. He, um, he set up the Future of Life Institute. Um, he's obviously a good friend of, of, of Elon Musk, and he's, he's, a, he's a prolific writer and speaker on this topic. Um, however, Max um, is a, um, an astrophysicist by trade. And um, one of the things which um, you know, I really wish that Max would do is, is maybe stick to his lane a bit more and, and maybe have a bit more dialogue with, uh, with those of us from a liberal arts or social sciences background. Because this picture on the screen shows uh, sort of Max's view of the world. He says, look, there's, you know, when you look at AI ethics, you have all of the things which are possible. Um, and then there's this tiny slice, which are, which are things we shouldn't be doing. And that's basically the line. The line is something we've got to find. To me, this is an overly, um, an overly simplistic uh, view of the world, but it's also not just overly simplistic. It's also, I think, wrong. Um, and that be that's because the line is probably somewhere else. The line is probably somewhere very, very different. And in fact, in many cases, there won't be such a clear thing as a line. There's going to be two lines. There's going to be those things which are clearly okay, those things which are clearly not okay, and then everything else in the, in the bit, middle, which is a bit of a mess. And this is what I call my, my tennis ball approach to, to ethics. Any ethics question is like a tennis ball in mid-flight. The question is trying to find where the lines are. Um, but that's really where the metaphor of, of, of ethics and, and tennis um, stops, because you know it's not about passing something from one person to another person. It's really about the relational space between between two people. That's really what ethics is about. Um, and to, to use a long word, ethics is really an activity um, based in the intersubjective. When, when we have an intersubjective um, experience with another person, we have essentially three conversations. Um, we have the conversation that I'm having with you. Um, there's also the conversation that I'm having in my own head, um, the feedback I'm receiving from you and, and how that makes me feel. And there's also the feedback and the conversation that you're having in your own head. And that whole space, that whole space is, is an ethical space. And the activity of ethics is, is what's, what's important. So we can put down our, our tennis rackets um, and, and we need to kind of find this space. And we need to create conditions that enable us to flourish and, and um, experience this space in a, in a, in a great way. And, and it's that feedback loop um, um, that is so important. Um, one quote which I find so powerful, it's from, a, um, a, I think, a 17th century rabbi um, who gives this quote that kind of really explains the nature of the intersubjective and 
and, and the complexities of getting this wrong. And I'm just going to read this through very slowly. He said, if I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I, and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I, and you are you because you are you, then I am I, and you are you, and we can talk. And I just would like you all to think about that in, in your afternoon. Um, you know, if we are our, our authentic self in that intersubjective conversation with others, then we can have a, a truly ethics experience. And so what we need to build as organizations is feedback mechanisms to hear the feedback from stakeholders. We need to build, you know, something of community. We need to be authentic in that. And we need to build trust through actions and not words. Um, and I'm going to come on to what those actions specifically might mean um, very shortly. So, you know, in terms of why a principles-based approach might just make more make this problem a little bit worse, um, I'll give you an example. And this is something which many people, and it, this will be an image which many people will find quite horrifying, but is very much the picture of how the tobacco industry approached their question, a very similar question in the 1950s. Um, they met behind closed doors. Um, they realized there was a problem. There's an impact of their product on wider society. But at the same time as meeting behind closed doors, uh, they marketed a very different message. And in this case, they enlisted the help of doctors and dentists um, to market their products. And this is really not very different at all to how the tech industry is approaching the question of, of ethics. You know, what we're seeing is, is an advertising and marketing led response, um, but with very, very unclear substance behind it. And obviously, many of us can see straight through this. So what we're seeing is we're seeing principles, we're seeing lots of principles being published by organizations. And these are organizations who um, are launching products and services, and those products and services are getting external criticism, and they're also creating novel challenges for teams on the ground. And many of you watching this will be familiar with this. You might be uh, machine learning engineers who are looking at technical aspects of your products and services and haven't quite fully worked out um, you know, the, the consequences of this, but realize there's a, a great commercial opportunity to exploit if you launch it. And it's really those challenges on the front line that we need to we need to address. Um, and what's you know what's missing is is what I call substantive governance. Um, and um, and you know to, just to make all this kind of have a nice ring of P to it, you know, we need pronouncements. We need decisions based you know on the on the um, on the detail of that particular instance. So in in this case, this is what we do. In that case, um, you know th then then the facts will be different. We don't we don't. You know, that, that is much more useful than saying simply, we believe in justice, we believe in fairness, we believe in, in diversity, we believe in inclusion. You know, no one will disagree with those statements, but put into practice, it becomes very hard. Um, so if, if you're in a place where you're only looking at principles, um, but you're on the front line trying to make decisions in terms of how to sell or market or, or develop technology, then, you know, very much mind the gap. And this middle piece is what I call protocols. The protocols are what the thing you need to develop. Um, I'm going to come on in the next few slides in terms of actually what that might look like for your organization. So you've got a nice takeaway at the end of this. And if you do this, if you do um, think about practical operational steps, then there's a very beautiful thing about it. You can measure and monitor um, your, 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 um, your activity, which is something which you can't do if you look at simply the ethics principles. You know, if you look at Microsoft's ethics principles, you know, they talk about... Um, you know, fairness as a, as, a, as, a, as a major theme, compare that to another organization that might talk about justice as a major theme. You know, how do you compare justice and, 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 and equality? You can't. I mean, they're just, they're just words. And it's exactly the same exercise as saying, which logo do I prefer? Do I prefer Dell's logo to Apple's logo? I mean, that's a, sub, that's a subjective um, conversation. What you need instead is to be able to say, how much better is Dell's management of ethics over Microsoft? And that's a conversation you can only answer if you look at governance. And so if you are sitting there with a pen and paper, what I'd like you to do is just to draw a quick um, six by three matrix. So along the top, um, um, you've got some six columns from, from one to five and a, and a zero. Um, and then you've got three um, three factors. And, and you know, what I just want to point out here is that when I talk about ethics, I talk about that, that intersubjective um, social impact state. It's really feedback from, 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 from stakeholders. And an example of that would be you know, people setting fire to 5G masks because they think it's um, ca causing uh, COVID. Um, is, is a, is a, there's, a, there's an ethics problem in that. Technology has been imposed on people 
um, and, and they don't feel comfortable with it. Things like um, racist chatbots or, or facial recognition technology that's gone wrong, um, or you know, that's a risk management problem, a safety problem. Those things require um, um, technical solutions and process. And there's a regulatory field as well, which is all about public policy. So those are the three themes. And so what I would like you to do very quickly is just do two things once you've drawn out this box. Think about where you are as an organization right now, where, how mature you think you are on a scale of, of zero to five. And then think about how mature you would like to be as an organization on the same scale, let's say in the next three years. Um, once you've done that, once you've marked you know, basically six crosses on your sheet of paper, one for each risk, regulatory and ethics, where you are now and where you want to be, um, then I can start filling in the blanks. And I probably don't have time to go through this in detail. So I'll, I'll, I'll let this slide build out and I'll let, I'll let you all screen grab what's on the screen. But essentially, um, the, you, can, you can look at the, the milestones of each of these points and say, you know, how mature is, is your organization? And what, what will be interesting is once you see the detail of what we think really good quality, uh, best practice ethics management looks like, then, um, then you can recalibrate that with your with your original answers, and that's quite a useful exercise. Um, and what we really need, and what I believe, and this is what my firm is is set out to do, is I think we need to have you know ratings um, which um, which are objective um, and 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 enable us to compare organisations, and that's exactly that's exactly what we do. And it's useful to consumers. It's useful to um, it's useful to the investor community. Um, but it's also useful to you and your organization because it enables you to to build a very clear roadmap in terms of you know where you are, where you want to be, and how to get there. Um, and that's a, yeah, this is a, an example that we've done recently. Uh, the company that's uh, this is an anonymized example. Uh, the company that's labeled there in D is a company that's been in the news for lots of uh, lots of reasons. Uh, they've done some some silly things with technology, and they've they've felt the heat. And a large result of that is because they've got governance problems, which um, we're helping them to, 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 to rectify. But what's really interesting about this exercise is even though they are facing a lot of reputational heat, um, they are actually very similar in terms of the, the governance that they've got in place to a few other organizations who've been lucky enough to, to dodge the bullet. Um, and actually, you know, it, it can be comforting as well to know that you're only just behind competitors, but also if you are in, in one of those other boxes, um, it can be a, a, a sign of warning. So what I've covered in the last 15 minutes or so is, you know, a basic understanding of you know what the tech clash is and, and what you need to to cover it, and hopefully you can take away that you and your team can indeed um, avoid the tech clash if you focus on protocols and not principles. And also, I've given you a tool that hopefully will enable you to be able to monitor and measure this back into your own organisation. Um, at that point, I'll uh, hand over back to David, and if you've got any questions, then feel free to contact me later on today. Many thanks.